Welcome to the podcast of the American Diversity Report. I'm Deborah Levine, your host and the editor of the ADR. Today, we have an unusual, wonderful collaboration with Avi Hoffman. Avi? And so I am the founder and CEO of the Yiddishkeit Initiative. Uh, we go by the brand Why I Love Jewish. And uh, this is unusual because normally I would be introducing Deborah Levine, not only the editor-in-chief of the American Diversity Report, she's very modest. She's also an award-winning author of 15 books, a Forbes magazine diversity and inclusion trailblazer. Her books include When Hate Groups March Down Main Street, Teaching Curious Christians About Judaism, The Unbiased Guide for Leaders, and The Matrix Model Management System. But what I'm more than fascinated to learn about is your family history, because apparently you're four generations Jews in Bermuda. Yes, in Bermuda. <laughs> <laughs> that to me, because I interview many, many Jewish people from all over the world, and I'm always fascinated by the histories, but that to me is one of the most unique histories, because apparently you were the only Jewish family on the island. So I look forward to talking about that. Um, but also you're, you have a documentary called Unstold, Untold Stories of a World War II Liberator which will be seen on Jewish Life Television. And it's based on the memories of a Polish, Holo Polish Holocaust survivor named Leon Weisband and more excitingly, the wartime letters of your father, Aaron Levine, who was a liberator and he was assigned to irrigate, to interrogate the Nazi prisoners of war. Yes. And it, Again, I am just so blown away. You're a speaker, a consultant, a coach to nonprofits. Your clients have included New York University, SunTrust Bank, the United States National Park Service, the city of Chattanooga, as well as Volkswagen, Nissan, and Lazy Boy. So I could not be prouder to have you on my little podcast, Schmoozing with Avi, ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Levine. Oh, thank you so much, Avi. You know, you have done so much for the Jewish community online. Uh, I hope people understand what schmoozing is. We're going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> important issues and share our backgrounds. Uh, you you have this great interest in making a difference for the Jewish community and for the world at large by counteracting hate and anti-Semitism. And I'm so delighted to be able to share our thoughts together here. Thank you. Thank you. It's my honor and my pleasure. <laughs> so ladies first, why don't you begin? Would you like me to begin in Bermuda? Well, um, yes, I want to know how a Jewish family going back four generations, we're talking about what, 120 years, the turn of the 20th century, 1880s, perhaps, 90, early 1900s, when and where from and how did your family get to be the only Jewish family and one of the founding 400 families of the island of Bermuda? That's right. So in the early 1900s, my great-grandfather uh, came from the Russian Pale, immigrated to America, came through uh, the uh, New York, window of opportunity, came down the southern uh, coast to Atlanta and was a tailor in an Atlanta department store. Now, we never figured out just why he decided to take a boat to Bermuda, but he did. And he took a boat, came to Bermuda to be a tailor in a department store there. 
called trimming hacks, okay? And then brought his family with him. My grandfather at the time was a traveling salesman for tobacco companies in the South. He only had an eighth grade education and he came to Bermuda and was a salesperson. In fact, founded one of the first general stores on the island. He was also, however, born in America. So um, when World War I came around, he was a, a part of the Navy. Right? One day he was uh, at a bar in New Orleans and said to a fellow sailor, I just got engaged. And the sailor said, yeah, to whom? And he said, a wonderful gal named Ida Swig. And the sailor said, excuse me, that's my sister. So, <laughs> so he brought March, my, my grandpa, Meyer Malloy, up to Boston where the Swig family uh, lived. They, they were quite well known. He, ben, ben Swig was the first Jew to ever serve in the Massachusetts legislature. And, uh, and they got married. And so Meyer and Ida ended up in Bermuda uh, along with his dad. And then they had two kids, including my mom, uh, uh, who attended uh, Radcliffe and met my dad at Harvard. Mm. Wow, what an amazing story. <laughs> Did your family ever maintain any contact with their families that were left in the pale? And do they know what happened to them before, during, and after the wars? Some of the family have done uh, some history of, of, the, of the Swig family in particular. Uh, they, they, they held interesting roles in the pale. Um, but most of them, if not all of them, got out. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, great great grandfather, I think, walked from the Pale to the uh, the French uh, border through France, and then he took a boat to America, hmm. um, and then sent for the family. So it it's been an interesting, rather. Um, pioneering spirit kind of family it, 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 for me i'm jealous <laughs> you know, no 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 i am because my family i'm a first generation american both oh. of my parents survived the holocaust Ooh. and lost most if not all of their family members in the war so I cannot really track my family back more than a couple of generations. Um, and only by chance, some of my family, uh, my father's family members who came to America in the early 1900s went back to Europe to visit and they took pictures. And it's only because of those photographs from 1923 that I know what my grandparents and great-grandparents looked like. But they were all lost in the war. My father and three of his siblings survived uh, out of 12. So, yeah. And, and all the families and everybody else. And, you know, they were all sent to Auschwitz. Mm. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So, so you grew up in Bermuda? Yes. Um, after the war, uh, and dad returned from military service, uh, I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> but in just a few months later, we went back to Bermuda uh, to be with uh, her parents. And we stayed for uh, seven or eight years. So hmm. I grew up, I attended what my mother had attended, which was the Bermuda High School for Girls. It was Anglican. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and learned to speak very proper English, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, which was not particularly appreciated on the recess playground when I came back to New York, when daddy wanted us to be part of a Jewish community. 
Right. I was going to ask, by the time you were growing up a little bit in Bermuda, were there other Jewish families? And did you have any kind of Jewish upbringing? What was your Jewish upbringing in Bermuda? Uh, there, there was no synagogue. Uh, there were very few Jewish families. Some came through as part of, say, the, the American naval base that was uh, there at the time. Uh, so they came and went, uh, and mostly we met them uh, at Passover Seder. And that was the one time that we imported a rabbi for Passover. And they came down, and uh, we had uh, the Passover Seder uh, in, in one of the uh, hotels. Uh, and it was, uh, everything had to be imported, and it was just wonderful. I loved it. And we did that until my grandparents passed away and I no longer went down to visit. Um, the, the, um, there were occasionally a Jewish family which would come for a while. Uh, there was one whose last name was uh, Ferguson. You know how they came? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. But they, that's the that's actually the old joke. I, I, I don't know. know if you're familiar. Sean Ferguson. Yes. So it was Sean Ferguson. There, there was an actual Jewish family named Ferguson. Yes. And oh there was, my goodness. There is a funny story about Walter Winchell coming down to Bermuda and meeting both my dad, my grandpa Meyer Malloy and the Ferguson family and going back to New York and doing this radio show that he did saying, you're not gonna believe this, but the two Jewish families in Bermuda are named Malloy and Ferguson. Oh, that's hysterical. <laughs> yeah. That is hysterical. Did you celebrate other holidays on your own within the family? Was there a Hanukkah, a Purim? You know, Passover, I get, you know, very important, importing a rabbi. Um, <laughs> Not much. Uh, occasionally, we would go to the base for Sabbath service. Uh, and um, that was, you know, a, a very small <laughs> group, <laughs> but it was on the base. And that's where uh, I, I met other uh, Jewish families, really. And and it was uh, wonderful to, to be part of it. They had a little uh, Torah that you, I, I have a picture of my grandfather holding, not that mm. he could read Hebrew, mind you, but he could speak it. So when the Holocaust survivors came from Europe over to America, they stopped off at Bermuda uh, at mm. one time. And dad was called, grandpa was called in to translate uh, for them. And it was the High Holy Days, and this was before um, I was born, I think. The High Holy Days, the survivors came off the boat and there was no synagogue. So the Anglican Cathedral and the Archbishop uh, there uh, hosted the um, Yom Kippur services there. But they would have been speaking Hebrew or Yiddish. Well, they spoke Yiddish, but they could go through the service itself. Yes, of course. Right, right. right. And, um, and the only person who really knew Hebrew that well was the, was the Anglican Archbishop. Uh, <laughs> that's so funny I, I'm just the whole thing is so amusing to me and yet so Jewish I mean in a way it's a quintessential Jewish story and I love that when did you when you were growing up when would you say your Jewish identity became something that that you you embraced or or uh, if you have i assume you have oh, um yes. but but and but how did that express itself how did your jewishness express itself and at what age did you really come to terms with it so when we came to new york uh one of the first things we did was join a synagogue and um it was a reform synagogue and my mother became a teacher at uh, maybe the kindergarten or something where you didn't need too much Hebrew yet. 
and she took me along with her as quote her teacher's aide mm -hmm. right so that i would be exposed to uh, what it was like to be jewish from a very early age seven or eight and and be in charge and um it took it was amazing i i was a teacher's aide all through high school. And when we moved to Cincinnati and she became the principal at Rockdale Temple, she had me take over one of the classes. I think it was second grade. Right? And um, wow. she always had in mind that I would be not just Jewish, but a teacher yeah. and, and have some fun doing it. And the first thing I did, well, you, Actually, she bribed me to be a teacher. She said, I tell you what, I'll give you the best teacher's aid we have, high school student. And I said, okay, you're on. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. So I was confirmed in the reform tradition. Uh, and then going to Harvard, So daddy drove me up to Harvard. He still didn't know what he had done during the war at that point. We get to the, the dorm, get up to the first floor, walk through the hall, but it was crowded. We could barely get through and it was all full of television reporters and, and, and it was loud and noisy. And I said, daddy, I don't think they're here for me. And uh, we keep walking and it turns out they were in my dorm room and they were interviewing my dorm mate and her dad, who was Senator Eugene McCarthy. And daddy said, hey, kid, you're going to learn more than you ever thought. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so. Well, at least it wasn't Joe McCarthy. So there you go. Oh, it was, it was wonderful. And Mary wow. and I. We were somewhat of a, an interesting duo for that. I was going to say, how many uh, female students were there at the time? Well, Radcliffe had not merged with Harvard yet. That came next year. That was mm. another interesting story. So there were about 400 freshmen at Radcliffe uh, compared to maybe 1,000 freshmen at Harvard. Yeah. Fascinating, just fascinating. But you say you didn't know about your father's World War II efforts until when? So I, I, I started to have a hint about it in um, when I became the director of the Jewish Federation in Rock, Rockford, Illinois, and started to uh, actually make a video uh, for classroom use about the Holocaust by interviewing um, survivors, liberators, all kinds of folks who were personally involved. Uh, and, and Daddy was a bit hesitant about being involved at all. Mm. But I was, I was just, it grabbed me. So I became the um, Community Relations Director of the Tulsa Jewish Federation shortly after the Oklahoma City bombing. Mm. Dealing with neo-Nazis, being trained in security by the FBI. Yeah. That's when <laughs> my father had a small meltdown, took a, a plane from Cincinnati over to Tulsa to make sure that they were taking good care of his baby. Mm told me a little bit about himself. And I'm like, what? You did what? <laughs> and I arranged for him to do a radio interview for the first time ever. Wow. And that's wow. what he told me he had all this. And there were a series of letters, apparently. Yes, hidden away in a file cabinet in his closet. I had no idea. And he started to share those. So you actually got the opportunity to go over these letters with your father able to tell you more about them. 
a little bit. I found them very difficult to read. But I did, I did talk to him and we had conversations. I started to write a memoir called The Liberator's Daughter. Okay. So I, I ran it by him and, and God love him. He says to me, um, well, you're improving, which <laughs> meant crap, right? So <laughs> I kept trying and trying. And to tell you the truth, I did not publish it until after he had passed away. And I had a little distance and I read more of the, of the, book, of the uh, letters. In fact, I had to do a second memoir to really completely pull in the letters. Uh, and um, uh, both of them together are quite, have been quite popular. It's called the Magic Marble Tree and it's much more personal than the first one. But you know, I'm fascinated by what seems to be becoming a trend a little bit, only in the sense that now here we are in the year 2023 and people are discovering things that were left over by their parents or their grandparents uh, before, during and after the war. I know two other projects that I am personally connected to in one way or another um, that deal with daughters or, or relatives finding letters from either their father or in one case, an uncle. One uh, written by a book written by a very dear friend named Eleanor Risa. It's called The Letters Project, A Daughter's Journey. And it's basically a similar story, except her father passed away when she was four, oh, uh, 17 or so. Uh, she was a young woman when her father passed away. And she found a pack of letters that he had written in German to her mother. And the letters she had written back. So that was a collection she had to figure out. And it was quite stunning. The other is something called Letters to Ellen. And it's about a soldier in World War II at Iwo Jima, a Jewish soldier, writing letters back home and specifically targeted, saying to kiss his niece, the little baby Ellen, who had been born recently. She was a young, well, Ellen is now a, 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 a woman of a certain age who found these letters and have has turned it into a into a, a program and a film and a book potentially and it's fascinating just fascinating um and very important that we find and bring these things to light um can you tell us a little bit our, our viewers have now watched the film and i'm curious about how you were able to take these letters and reinterpret them into books and a film. Thank you for asking. Um, the, the book, The Memoir of the Liberator's Daughter, uh, was uh, the first in the uh, process. And uh, I started that 20 years ago and it has taken me quite some time both to, to do the emotional work going into it and to pull it all together so that it, it, it makes sense to and include both the immigrant experience, right, the wartime experience and what I've done with it. Um, the, the second book then was more personal with a lot of the love letters during the war of my dad and my mother. And then a, a woman who I never met on, on Facebook said, I have the memoirs of a Polish Holocaust survivor. He's no longer with us, but I promised he would be published. Will you look at it? Mm. I said, sure, I'll look at it. Well, she sent me the originals in the mail. I almost I had a fit, right? Oh, <laughs> I have donated them since to the American Jewish archives where my dad in retirement was the chief financial officer. 
but I rolled them into the, the story too. And I'm not sure exactly how, but the passion made it happen, pulling it together. Having said that, writing a script is an entirely different proposition, right? And I had, um, I had been contact, I, I had done a presentation about the Liberator's Daughter and Dad's Letters at uh, a Unitarian a Congregational Church in Chattanooga. I had been approached by someone in the audience asking if I would go on stage with him to introduce a movie he'd been involved with called Wrestling Jerusalem. And I said, I'd think about it. So I, I did a little research on who this person was and it turned out he's a Hollywood producer and actor. And I said, okay. So I went on stage with a gentleman named Dylan Kussman. Uh, and uh, I called Dylan a few years later and I said, how about you find someone for me to turn these books into script for, te for TV or, or a movie? And he said, nope. We don't have enough women in Hollywood writing, directing, doing anything. You are going to do it. Excuse me, I've never done anything like that in my life. So finally, I did hire Dylan. And the original project was a TV script about my life mm. uh, for a six part series called The Liberator's Daughter. Mm. And my cousin in Madison. Jan, who, who is in the theater business, she said, it's great, but it's going to take you a long time to get that produced. Try doing a, a radio, just an audio first. So I said, okay. And I did write the script because now I knew how. And believe me, it wasn't easy. And I asked my other cousin, Michael Levine, who is a composer in Hollywood, if he would do some music for us. It was just beautiful. And so it, it started to take shape. And then when I talked to Jewish Life TV, they said, well, we need visuals to it. My other son-in-law, Eric, started me on iMovie and my contact at uh, Jewish Life mentored me into making it to a standard that would go national, if not international. And I'm so grateful for all these wonderful people who have worked with me to make this possible. Mm. Couldn't have done it our way. What, a, what an amazing and wonderful story. It just, it proves that you can do anything. You can really do anything if you set your heart and mind to it and you, and you really figure it out. It, it's a process. Everything is a process. Uh, in our work with YI, we are constantly looking for these projects that we can make happen, um, whether it's, you know, this podcast or films that we've been involved in, television programming, lectures, classes, everything is possible um, and very, very important work. Tell um, us a little bit more about the projects that you do. Oh, my um, all my life, I have been involved in Jewish culture, Yiddish, the Yiddish language was my first language. And my mother, like yours, was an educator. She was a teacher in a Yiddish school. She taught kindergarten. She was my teacher. And she believed until the day she retired after 25 years at Columbia University as a professor, um, she believed that the arts were the real secret to teaching. And so everything she taught had some kind of an artistic element, whether it was music or theater, obviously literature and poetry and music, um, the historical context. And so from the time I was four years old, I was a performer. And so it, my I started professionally in the Yiddish theater when I was 10 years old. 
And so all my life, I have been performing and finding ways to use the arts as a way to reach people and tell stories. And I think storytelling is ultimately what all our lives are about. We tell each other stories and we tell ourselves stories. Um, and so I was always uh, in the theater. I was always in film and television. Um, I, I, once I became an adult, I started working in theater in New York and produced shows, acted in shows, did many shows, eventually wrote my own shows, which I encourage every performer to explore. Um, how do you write a play about it? How do you tell your story? Um, and everybody has a story. And so as I got older, I realized that um, the Jewish cultural world was probably not going to be the most financially rewarding. The arts in general are not necessarily. So I started moving into the nonprofit arena. And so in the 80s, uh, my mother and I were collaborating with one of the greatest Broadway producers ever, uh, the, one of the greatest American producers ever, Joseph Papp. Uh, at the Public Theater in New York, the New York sure. Shakespeare Festival. Sure. So Joe Papp uh, in the 80s rediscovered his Jewishness and he started exploring his Jewish roots. My mother was at that point a journalist in the Forward newspaper, a professor at Columbia, a playwright and an author. Um, and he and she hit it off and I came in as a theater person, my mother as the writer, and we actually created the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater, uh, which was a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting Yiddish literature and poetry and culture through the theater, through the theatrical arts. We produced a very successful show in New York called Songs of Paradise. Um, and then he passed away. And that kind of took the wind out of what we were doing. But then I moved back into the nonprofit world uh, in an effort to promote Jewish culture because I felt and still feel um, that, you know, certainly the non-Jews don't really know that much about who we are, which is why anti-Semitism is still so popular. Um, and getting popular, more popular all the time, because there's a lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge. If you know someone, if you know their story, it's much easier to accept them. If you don't, then how easy it is to use them as a scapegoat for all that is wrong in the world. Um, so not only to teach the non-Jews about who we are and what we do and why we are so much a part of what they think of as their mainstream culture. You know, I heard a story about an anti-Semite in Europe who met someone and found out they were Jewish and were, were very upset. And the Jew, uh, the Jewish person said to them, but you know our call, you, what's your favorite TV show? He said, Seinfeld. I said, well, <laughs> Seinfeld is Jewish. And the man said, absolutely not. That's impossible. Seinfeld isn't Jewish. Well, yeah, Seinfeld is Jewish. So I actually taught a course at the university um, called Yiddish Theater, the Foundation of Modern Culture. The idea being that if you look back at everything we think of as modern culture, the word schmooze, you said, well, I don't know if everybody knows schmooze. Well, schmoozing or schmooze is one of over 5,000 Yiddish words that have become part of the Webster's Dictionary English language. Um, more than any other language, Yiddish has become a mainstream part of our culture. But the film, television, comedy, music, I mean, the list is endless. But what I also dis discovered, to my chagrin, is that many of the Jewish people don't know about our culture, about our shared treasures. And so our organization is dedicated to preserving, promoting, 
and presenting um, what we think of as the best of our culture to not only non-Jewish audiences to fight anti-Semitism through the arts, but also within our own culture to teach and, and illuminate the wonderful treasures that we all share that many of us no longer are familiar with. Um, and so our organization tries to do that through all the medium, whether it's publishing books, which we've now published seven books, through um, uh, theatrical presentations, through festivals. We have festivals all year round where we celebrate uh, Jewish culture. We, we remember all of the Holocaust remembrance events in Kristallnacht, the anniversary of Kristallnacht, uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and uh, our Why I Remembers program for Shoah, Yom HaShoah, which is part of what we're showing today. Um, and so we try to educate children. We have children's programming. We work on academic programming. We have Holocaust education programming in the Miami-Dade school system. And we're trying to develop a national, um, a national standard, shall we say? And I hope that you and I can work together to indeed bring programs like yours and ours and many, many others out there to a national and international audience in a way that um, helps fight what I believe is the most dangerous uh, phenomenon that I never thought I would live to see in my lifetime here in the United States of America and around the world, the, the incessant rise of virulent anti-Semitism at the highest levels since World War II. That's the reality. There are people in our government today who don't find it a, a bad thing that Hitler did what he did and that somehow we Jews are responsible for all the bad things happening in the world and in America. <laughs> um, and I think that's ridiculous and I think we have to fight it. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you more uh, at length about the efforts that can and should be done. And that's what our organization is devoted to, fighting anti-Semitism through the arts. Absolutely. You know, my father, uh, in terms of training to do what he did, interrogate Nazi prisoners of war, was trained at a secret mm -hmm. military intelligence camp called Fort Ritchie. I don't know. If yes, you're... of course. He was a Ritchie boy. Yes. And in doing the documentary, I contacted this place because now it's a museum. You know, and I said, I, I'm doing this and I want you to be part of this. And I think the more the merrier that we pull together our different experiences and our audiences and how we are doing this. Uh, it, it, it's just a beautiful thing. Uh, and it brings out so many diverse experiences that are fascinating. For example, did you know that I met uh, <laughs> uh, the author of the joys of Yiddish, <gasps> Rostin. Of course! Oh my goodness! Yeah. I was in his home. Wow, <laughs> the greatest! That's the Bible, yeah. the joys of Yiddish and the joys of Yinglish, <laughs> which yeah. is a whole other language in a way. Well, I. I and what I, were the circumstances? What were the circumstances of you meeting Leo Rostin, who also went by the, um, the pen name uh, uh, Leonard Q. Ross? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. He wrote, he wrote a book called The Education of Hyman Kaplan. 
Oh, yes, of course. And that was Leo Rostin under the pseudonym oh, Leonard Q. Ross. That's right. I love it. Well, I was at Radcliffe with his daughter. Okay, and um, we were at uh, her their apartment in New York City, at a at a party, and uh, I met him. We talked together, and um, I don't know if you knew this, but he, I think it was his mother-in-law was the famous anthropologist agri- <laughs> anthropologist Margaret Mead who I was incredibly a fan of. I'm sorry, how was he related (laughs) to Margaret Mead? It it may have been his mother-in-law. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. How extraordinary. And I was studying cultural anthropology at Radcliffe, Harvard. Uh, And uh, to me, the integration of all these different people was just perfect. Uh, and it's it's been a, an, an amazing uh, journey for for me uh, because not only did I d- get a degree in cultural anthropology, ending up my last year in, at New York University, but I also then got a degree from Spertus Institute Jewish Studies uh, for for Judaism. And then a degree in urban planning, which I often Hmm. uh, apply to the arts because uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but uh, I was a dancer and I had my own dance company and I taught the deaf how to do ballet. And my dance company was located in the basement Cincinnati St. Rita School for the Deaf. And then I became part of a a Baroque dance company and had my own Baroque dance company. Uh, And my first publication was about André Laurent, a French Jewish dance master Mm. at the time of Louis XIV. (laughs) Yeah. Wow, you (laughs) see... (laughs) <laughs> These are the stories that I'm looking for uh-huh. because, you know, look, almost everybody knows Fiddler on the Roof at this point, all over <laughs> the world. Um, what most people don't realize is that Fiddler on the Roof was actually written or based on the stories of Sholem Aleichem's Tevye the Dairyman that were written in Yiddish. Um, but these kinds of stories are what I believe can really bring the Jewish people together in a non-political, non-threatening, non-nationalistic way. We can celebrate all of these wonderful cultural threads that we can all find and that most people don't know. And that's what our organization really is dedicated to, is serving as a as a warehouse, a, 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 um, an umbrella for all of the Jewish cultural, all of the Jewish creativity, all of our wonderful stories um, that, that need to be told forever and ever. Hitler tried to, to destroy our entire existence and wanted to create a museum of dead Jews. I think our mission has to be, and continuing mission needs to be, the growing celebration of all of our Jewish culture and what we have contributed to the world. Um, Oh, it sounds like we have so many things to talk about in the future, so much more to explore. Um, Huh, fascinating, fascinating and fascinating. Um, Is is there anything else you would like to know about what we do? I'm curious to know more about your choice to create the American Diversity Report, which is such a wonderful 
way to celebrate, obviously, more than just the Jewish side of yourself, you know, in many ways, that takes it to the whole next level, which is how diverse is America? And every one of these stories needs to be told. How did that happen? Well, uh, almost two decades ago, I was uh, doing a, an, an online newsletter in a sort of PDF format about the diversity in the world and what was happening. And a gentleman came to me who was the IT director of the local newspaper, Chattanooga Times Free Press. And he said to me, what you have here is so amazing. You need to grow out of the PDF world into the online virtual world, and I will help you. And so he uh, assisted me in taking the American Diversity Report in, from that little newsletter onto the virtual screen. And we had a, a wonderful uh, uh, inauguration of it at the local uh, community college and we were off and running and I published voices from all over the world, as well as Jewish voices, um, in part because writing was something I needed to do. I had been very ill as a Jewish Federation director on a mission that included Uzbekistan. And I, it was surprising that I was still alive and I wanted to make a difference for whatever time I had on this planet. And so off I went. Who knew that I'd be still doing it 16 years later, right? Wow. And podcasts and who knows what else. And one of the things that happened, and, and I should share this with you, is that maybe eight years ago, um, the American Diversity Report was hacked. And in its place was a screen uh, that said, um, death to the Zionist lady. And uh, it was a, a death threat and it had replaced the American Diversity Report. And unfortunately it had done the same for all of the clients of my mentor. And that's when he said, hey, you're a smart lady. Do it yourself, go on your own platform, bye. And I did. And so I do it all myself. And I'm grateful to my mother. I need to give a, a shout out to my mom, who back in 1965 told me they're offering matrix algebra, which is the basis for computer programming at your high school, you're taking it. I said, mm -hmm. no, mommy, I'm going to be a poet, a philosopher. And she said, this is not a suggestion, dear. This is the future. Okay, and so um, I've actually been a, an IT director for an organization back in the early 1980s. So, so it's interesting that you and I share a lot in common. Um, I bet we do with moms. <laughs> well, not just moms. I mean, my mother and I founded this organization seven years ago together, and a lot of the work, uh, she's written several books and a lot of the work we do is is together. But my father, Oliver Shalom, who passed away 22 years ago this past week, was a pioneer in the computer industry. Uh -huh. You say IT, and I say my father had the largest data processing firm in the United States of America in 1969. Um, and is actually part of the history books. Uh, his company was called Abacus Associates. And uh, they were very actively involved in computer sciences and programming and data processing in the early to late 1960s. I love it. I love so, it. Uh, yeah. So, so it's interesting <laughs> that you and I have been around the um, IT world also since our, our youth. Well, you and I have more in common than I had ever imagined. I'm yes. really looking forward 
to collaborating with you on all kinds of wonderful projects to make a difference in this world. I hope so. I hope so. Your your American Diversity Report is fascinating. I've I've kind of gone through a little bit. Um, how do you decide who you interview? I'm, I'm sure many people want to to be and bring their stories to to the forefront. How do you decide um, who gets to be in your podcast? Well, they have to have some uh, uh, relationship with issues around diversity and inclusion and equity, right? So that's a, a basic decision uh, that, that uh, I make. Then um, I have a, a form, an interview form that they have to fill out. Which so, I did, I yes, filled out that form. I love it, <laughs> and I'm like, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, what comes of it is just amazing what people do. Not everyone fills it out to the point where I'm interested, by the way. Mm. Uh, they said, well, you know, you can look me up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. So uh, <laughs> uh, I have had um, the privilege of, of meeting people like yourself mm. uh, for several years now that we do the podcast. Uh, and it's been uh, just a joy to have these conversations and they are conversations they they are a bit informal like this so that we can get a feel for what really is happening and right. how people are really thinking and what they went through uh, and do you have a favorite story or a fa well, you know any favorite oh or most God. interesting interview you've done well, recently I did a wonderful interview of a, uh, of a Black woman who has been a, a part of executive boards of corporations in the IT world and, and amazing achievements who, like myself, right, started out as a secretary. And we just had a ball, right? May I didn't mention this, but I started out as a gal Friday in the New York City garment district. Wow. Uh-huh. And we traded notes. And it, it, we just really hit it off. And there's so many ways in which, you know, I have intersected with people, people who are authors and uh, corporate executives, nonprofit change makers, sometimes artists, you mm. know? And it's just. So let, let me, as we bring up this interview, this mutual interview to a yes. close, uh -huh. um, I'm curious, we started to talk about it a little bit before we started the program, um, but I'd like to, I think, end with it. Um, your work in diversity is ex incredibly important today because not only are we seeing a rise in anti-Semitism, we're also seeing a rise in, um, in prejudice and hatred and, you know, uh, violence in America and the world uh, and the lack of acceptance of others and the othering of so many. Um, how do you think based on your vast knowledge and experience, how do you think we, not only in America, but also globally, can realistically fight this human animal instinct to blame others and hate others and take action against others um, in our society? This is a great question, and it certainly deserves an answer. When I first created my matrix model management system, uh, cross-cultural wisdom, it was right after 9-11. And we were, as a country, as a world, you know, totally beschmuggled 
and we needed help. <laughs> and uh, that's when I, I formed something called the Women's Council on Diversity here so that we could tell our stories and be able to collaborate across cultural lines, which we had not done. And in doing that, I realized a lot of people uh, didn't know how to tell their stories. <laughs> and um, they were not very communicative. And so uh, I created uh, worksheets to help them understand that my major back in the 60s at Harvard was folklore and mythology and the science of storytelling. So to me, it was normal and natural, not so much, but with everyone else. So I, I created these worksheets only to find that they didn't turn them in at the end of the day. They took them home. They kept stealing them away. <laughs> and so I decided, okay, I get the point. I put them in a book. And in addition to the, the stories, I created something called emotion metrics because emotional intelligence goes along with this so importantly. But many times people who talk about emotional intelligence, it's just so much blah, blah, blah. And I wanted it measured. And so I have emotion metrics. And then over that, the overlay was my work in planning so that you could actually get something done. The three part thing of the matrix model management is what I've used ever since for decades. And one of the things that I have zeroed in on because it's very flexible for, for generational differences, national race, ethnicity, it is also helpful for religious diversity. And there are very few diversity professionals who do work in religious diversity. And that's me. Last question, because I'm so fascinated by what you're saying. So urban planning somehow seems to be the odd man out here. Um, but yet, now that you mention it, I wonder, does urban planning include diversity education? When you think, when you talk about urban planning, is there an element that you bring to it that deals with how do you plan an herb, an urban uh, society that includes educational components that can indeed help us to fight the anti-Semitism and the hatred and the prejudice and bring a, a, an acceptance to the academic world of K through 12, where it's probably most important and, and beyond. When you look at the urban planning and its history here in America, probably elsewhere too, uh, what you see is the, um, the segregation of cities into poor and less poor neighborhoods, black and white, you name it. It is, it is a, a sort of a demonstration of the, uh, the prejudice that we've had over decades, if not centuries. And dealing with it is, is, has always been uh, a difficult. A lot of people don't want to uh, recognize it and try to uh, work with it. Um, but that was part of, of what I, I did in the uh, master's degree that I got. By the way, I designed the urban planning degree that I received at the University of Illinois in Chicago to have a specific focus on arts and culture. Before mm. that, it never existed. But my view was that arts and culture, right, the key, right, to not only uh, cross-cultural education, but to economic development in all of these different neighborhoods, and that we needed to have a system for, for looking at that kind of development uh, and the uh, 
widespread effect that it might have. And, and I did that because I think I told you, I had been in the arts. I was, I had my own dance company. I had um, been <laughs> the development director for the Chicago City Ballet. I could understand both worlds and bring them together. And mm. the urban planning part is the systemic part of how you go about it. Right. Goals and objectives and tasks and, and deadlines and all these kinds of things. Think about how I worked with that back in 1980. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's really amazing. You and I have a lot to talk about and I look forward to it. Um, is there anything else you would like to share or you'd like to know? I know that you are going to uh, be doing quite a bit around the Holocaust. Yes. Uh, I would love for you to keep me updated on everything that's going on. Of course. And do you have a newsletter? We do have uh, e-blasts that we do on a regular basis. You will right. certainly be receiving them from here on in. Um, and we will continue to grow our organization. Perhaps with your help, we will reach greater and greater audiences. And uh, I think that one of the things I'd love to discuss with you uh, afterwards is the idea that there needs to be a national program. There needs to be a, a national program at the highest levels of leadership in the, in the American government and corporate world and cultural world to fight the hatred, encourage the diversity, and teach young and old alike, that the only solution that won't kill a lot of people, because we've been there before, um, is acceptance. We need to teach acceptance of others. And uh, perhaps together, you and I and many others uh, who are like-minded uh, we'll be able to make a dent. I don't suggest that we will solve the problem in our lifetime because this problem is uh, through the ages, but perhaps we could make a small dent um, in, in the problem and maybe divert the track away from growing to subsiding and, and becoming less. So having said that, uh, just for my viewers, um, I couldn't be more excited about this particular interview. I am incredibly honored to meet you, Deborah. And uh, please stay tuned. Go to whyilovejewish.org. Go to our YouTube channel. Go to our social media. Sign up and you will find out much more about what we do. And if you are so inclined, feel free to support our efforts in any way that you feel comfortable because we need your help. We need the whole world to stand with us as we pursue these lofty goals. Wonderful. Thank you. This has been just a joy to the American Diversity Report audience. Thank you for tuning in. I have a feeling you may have quite a number of comments when we publish this. I'm looking forward to hearing them. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah.